Hey everyone, it's Powerwall time. The Powerwall installation process was surprisingly quick considering just how much work Tesla's installers had to do. Most of it was all done by the end of the first day, and the second day was reserved uh, mostly for little things, making sure that the air conditioners were sorted, checking all of the wiring to make sure all circuits in the house were included, as well as commissioning the power walls and a few other detail things. But before I get too far into this, how about I give you a quick tour of what actually got put in the garage? Starting at the far end of the garage, we have the brains of the operation, the Tesla Home Energy Gateway. This box is the one that kind of brings everything together. So, for example, power from the grid passes through the meter outside, then through the 200 amp main outside, and then into this box right here. One of the key parts that's in here is the contactor, which can serve to isolate the house from the grid, which both, in a grid-down scenario, prevents the house from feeding to the grid, which could endanger line workers, and also, uh, in the event of a grid outage, prevents the house from functioning essentially as a generation site when the grid goes down, which could be very bad. Opening the box up, there's not really a lot to see in here, because there's a big safety panel in the way. But you can see there's a, a 200 amp main in here in addition to the 200 amp main outside. There's, just because of my house configuration, a bit of redundancy here. But in here are also all of these CT coils and electronics, which monitor the house's energy export to the grid, the amount of energy it pulls from the grid, the amount of energy being produced by the solar arrays, uh, the state of charge of the batteries, the energy flow through the batteries. All of that is monitored here and the data is then sent back to Tesla's servers. It has uh, both a cell radio in it, and it's connected to Wi-Fi, and it's connected via hardware Ethernet, uh, so it has plenty of connection options to make sure that it always has uh, a connection to Tesla's servers. The small box below the gateway is the generation panel. In here, you'll find breakers for each of the two solar arrays, as well as a breaker for each of the two power walls, and a 125 amp breaker that ties this panel into the gateway. To the right of the gateway is the loads panel. This is the panel where, well, all of the house loads are. So every breaker for every circuit in the house is here. So none of these are in the box on the outside anymore. A big part of the work was actually intercepting the wiring for each of the branches, bringing it down this piece of conduit here, into here, extending the wires, and then joining it up to all of the breakers. A little further into the garage, you'll find the two power walls. Each of these can store about 13 and a half kilowatt hours of energy and has a maximum continuous output of about five kilowatts. So combined, they store about 27 kilowatt hours and can output about 10 kilowatts, which is plenty to run the whole house, even if the air conditioners are on. 
Each of these rather large steel boxes contains lithium ion cells up to eh, about here or so, and then the upper portion of the enclosure is where you'll find the power electronics. So the bidirectional inverter, the pump for the liquid cooling system, the heat exchanger, the fan, all that kind of stuff. So these batteries are liquid cooled. So why did I get power walls? Well, it's because enough of you guys used my Tesla referral code a couple years ago to convince Tesla to throw a couple power walls my way. So thanks for that. As for whether buying power walls makes sense, that depends a lot on, well, where you live and what the net metering policies are like where you live and whether you have access to advantageous time of use rate schedules and whether you're a net consumer or a net producer of electricity. Like I covered in my Tesla solar video from a few months ago, which you should totally go watch, link in the video description, I'm now a net producer of energy. The real advantage for power walls is for people who are net consumers because it allows you to rate shift. For me, I produce so much energy that it just doesn't matter, but the power walls do allow me to dodge non-bypassable charges, even if they're almost nothing. Though the power walls rate shifting capabilities may prove very important in an upcoming project that I'll talk about in another video, and that's where the power walls different modes of operation come in. If you load up your Tesla app and select the home energy gateway, scroll down and select customize, you can see the three different modes well, really four, that the power wall can function in. First up, you have backup only mode, which as the name suggests, is purely using the power walls as battery backup. There's no rate arbitrage here at all. They'll only kick in if grid power goes down and they're charged from your solar panels. Next up is self-powered mode. Self-powered mode gets you as close to off grid as your system will allow. However, this mode doesn't have a lot of smarts tied to it. Basically what it does is when the sun comes up and your solar arrays begin producing energy, that energy goes to power your house, and then when enough energy is produced from the arrays, they begin powering the house and the batteries. Once the batteries are full, then it turns to powering the house and grid export with solar, and then as solar generation tapers off, it switches to powering the house from the batteries, until the batteries are dead, or they reach your user-defined reserve setting, and then you switch over to using grid power until the sun comes back up again. And that reserve setting in there is what allows you to set aside a certain percentage of the power wall's capacity to only be used in the event of a grid outage. That way, you're never actually out of power. It will always be able to have something there to function as a whole house backup. Scrolling down to the advanced mode, this is where time-based control comes in, and you can choose between either balanced or cost-saving mode. The idea behind balance mode is it's taking into account your time of use rate schedule as well as your usage habits to optimize the usage of the battery to kind of split the difference between self-powering and making absolutely certain that you're not pulling from the grid during your peak times. To make this work, you have to uh, configure your price schedule. So you hit edit price schedule, and then it brings up your time of use rate schedule. So this is my time of use rate schedule with the orange being peak time, the gray is shoulder, and the blue is off peak. And you can set different rate schedules for the weekday and the weekend. Once you've got your rate schedule all set, you hit done, and then the system takes care of everything. I did experiment with both of these modes a bit, and you can see here in balance mode that the system really is trying to split the difference between uh, self-powered and purely rate shifting. So the house doesn't pull from the grid at all during peak times. In fact, it's trying to optimize it such that the power generated by solar is all pushed out to the grid during peak times. During shoulder rate, you're powering the house from the solar, you're charging the batteries, and exporting any excess out to the grid. And then during the off-peak, the battery cuts in and out to try to compensate for any large loads that may come on, but there's also a period kind of in the middle of the night where it just shuts down and sleeps so that you don't drain the batteries completely before morning. Cost saving mode, on the other hand, is much more aggressively dedicated to rate arbitrage, rate shifting, to maximize the monetary benefit of the power walls. Here, for example, you can see that anytime you're in the off-peak period, the power walls are not running the house. That is entirely being powered off of grid power. And then early in the day, solar energy is directed into the batteries to charge the batteries as quickly as possible while the house runs off of grid power rather than using some of that solar energy to also run the house. And then once the batteries start entering their higher state of charge, you see more of that energy is diverted to the grid. And then as soon as the peak rate hits, all battery charging stops 
and that battery power is used to run the house while all solar energy is run to the grid. And then as soon as the peak period ends, the battery usage stops. That way the system has the highest chance of being able to recover the batteries via solar as quickly as possible the following day so that you have enough solar energy stored in the batteries to make it all the way through the peak period again. This is probably the mode that would be most useful if you use far more energy than your solar panels produce. So let's say you have a fairly small solar array, maybe only a four kilowatt or a 3.8 kilowatt. Um, this is probably the mode that'll work out best for you but uh, it, it, I recommend experimenting. If you want a bit of a deeper dive into the advanced modes for the power walls and what it means monetarily, Ben Sullins over at Teslanomics put together a pretty good video about that, and there's a, a link in the video description below. You should probably check that out if you're considering power walls. In keeping with the trend of practically every interaction I have with Tesla having something go wrong, the installation was not without a few hiccups. The installation was finished on September 13th of 2019, but all of the little bugs and problems and stuff weren't completely worked out until mid-November. Thankfully, the problems I experienced, for the most part, were pretty small. After day two of the installation completed, I found that one of the two air conditioners that's part of our central air conditioning system wouldn't start up at all, uh, and it was Pretty unfortunate because it was warm here in September, actually quite warm here in September, and the air conditioner that wasn't working is the one that cools the side of the house with the master bedroom. So my wife and I ended up setting up a inflatable mattress in the projector room, which is on the part of the house that is on, that was being covered by the working air conditioner. You know, so it wasn't like 90 degrees in here when we were trying to sleep. Thankfully, one of the Tesla installers came back out on a Sunday to make sure that everything got fixed and taken care of as quickly as possible. So props to them, got it taken care of. But there were a few other little issues. Curse this winter sun for setting so early. There we go, that's better. Right, other issues I encountered. There were two main issues, the first of which being that whenever the power walls were at a high state of charge, like 97 to 100-ish percent state of charge, and the grid went down and the power walls entered backup mode, the first thing they did was increased the AC frequency to 65 hertz, which is very, very high. Here in the US, normally that's 60 hertz. Typically you don't see deviations uh, above like 60.5 ever. Uh, but anyway, they jumped to 65 hertz, and the reason they did that was to force any solar inverters that are connected to the power walls to shut down. Because when the power walls are at a very high state of charge, uh, you don't have anywhere for that solar energy to go, and that's a problem. And so the idea is to pulse to 65 hertz to shut down even the oldest, junkiest solar inverter that they could possibly encounter for safety reasons. However, in my case, that jump to 65 hertz was, one, unnecessary because both of my solar inverters fault at much lower frequencies. Basically, as soon as you cross about 60.5 hertz, they will both fault. You don't have to go higher than that to get them to shut down. But going to 65 hertz meant that my air conditioners stopped working. Neither of them would start up when in that high frequency state. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, the power supply for my irrigation timer also didn't function. And my refrigerator sounded awful running at 65 hertz because when you increase AC frequency without a corresponding decrease in voltage, you're going to cause a lot of AC motors to just run faster. And that's what was happening to the compressor in my refrigerator. It sounded awful. And going all the way to 65 hertz meant that all of my uninterruptible power supplies running all of my computer equipment would trip. And that was a problem because they'd all die long before the power walls discharged enough to lower their AC frequency into a range where they wouldn't trip. But you know, at that point, obviously all my computer hardware would have lost power. While that whole high state of charge grid outage thing may sound like a corner case, it's one that I would encounter any time the grid would go out after about one in the afternoon during the summer. And since the air conditioners wouldn't start, that eliminates the largest loads that would be placed on the power walls, which would mean that it would take hours for the power walls to discharge enough to lower the AC frequency and allow things to turn on again. Unless, of course, someone was home to turn on an oven just to burn off some energy. 
After a bunch of emails back and forth with Tesla and some phone calls, I finally managed to get them to change the software configuration of my Powerwalls remotely and set the maximum AC frequency to 61.5 Hz, which is the lowest that they could set it. After convincing them to do that, everything worked. My air conditioners were fine, the refrigerator was fine, the uninterruptible power supplies were happy. It was all good. Now when the grid goes down at a high state of charge, the power walls jump to 61.5 Hz. Everything keeps working. The power walls slowly discharge, and as they do so, the AC frequency drops. Once that falls below 60.5 Hz, which is usually around 96% state of charge, the solar inverters come back on, start producing power, they send power to the house, they send power to the batteries, and as the batteries cross 97%, since they're charging, the AC frequency increases again. Once that crosses 60.5 Hz, the solar inverters fault and shut down, and the batteries are powering the house, and it just cycles like that and cycles like that over and over and over, until the solar inverters can't produce any more power because the sun went down, and then the house just runs on batteries. If you do some Googling or looking around in the forums, you'll see that the AC frequency spike to 65 Hertz is a pretty common issue, though not everyone has problems when it jumps to that high of a frequency. So if you experience something like that, you'll just have to work with Tesla to get them to adjust the frequency down to a point where one, it's safe, uh, and two, pretty much everything works. The other issue I experienced was a weird one. Basically, the home gateway was giving me garbage data. So the house load data that it was reporting in the app seemed tied to solar generation. So as solar generation increased, so did the reported house load, even though there was no actual increase in house energy consumption. I was also seeing strange things like uh, energy being exported to the grid at like 9 p.m., which the batteries shouldn't even be able to export power to the grid, but they were doing it. The phantom load issue during hours of solar production was so bad that, in this example, I shut down all of the breakers in the load panel so there could be zero house load, and yet a significant house load was still being reported by the gateway. Here you can see the gateway reported a significant drop in house load when it transitioned from using the batteries to charge one of my cars to pulling from the grid but there was no actual change in the charge rate on the car because I was able to pull up my open EVSE data and see that, nope, flat line. There was no change in the charge rate at all. That reported change by the gateway was just junk data. After more back and forth with Tesla, I scheduled to have a tech come out to diagnose the issue, but the soonest they could send that tech was November 11th, like three weeks from that, that point in the conversation with Tesla. Not great, but, you know, hey, wasn't a critical issue, really. Anyway, the tech came by, poked around a bit, and discovered that this whole mess was caused by the factory-installed CT coils in the gateway. So it wasn't anything that Tesla's installers did. They didn't make any mistakes there. It looked like the CT coils had shaken loose in shipping or something. And as soon as he tightened them, all of the readings from the gateway snapped right to where they should be, and everything has been fine since. With all that said, the power walls and the capabilities they offer are really cool, and they can, in the right circumstances, save you some money. Also, if you're a fellow Californian, they provide backup power so you're pretty much immune from the public safety power shutoffs that we've been having over the last few months. So that's good too. But as usual, Interfacing with Tesla is a pain in the butt. Their employees are great. All the installers, uh, the people you, you work with, they, they always try their best to make sure everything is taken care of as quickly as they can. But there still seem to be some, I don't know, structural issues when it comes to communicating with Tesla in general or communication within the organization to make things happen or make sure that your concerns are heard and addressed. Once those concerns actually make it to someone, things generally get fixed, regardless of whether we're talking about Tesla energy products or the cars. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I do have some more experiments planned for those power walls, like seeing how long we can run off-grid, but that will probably have to wait for spring or maybe summer, because we've had a lot of storms lately, and storms combined with winter sun really puts a damper on solar generation, and that's a problem when you drive two electric cars. Uh, anyway, if you have any questions about solar or power walls or whatever, go ahead and leave those in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. I should also have some more power wall content lined up for later this year when that project that I haven't actually told you about yet starts ramping up. Uh, but as always, I'll see you later.